Are you digging up the dirt on your dead? Want to find out how? Hear the latest on new family history sources and websites with interesting and fun guests and experts. Find out what other people have been learning about their ancestors. From kings to thieves, inventors to farmers, nothing that's been discovered should surprise us anymore, but it always does. Find out what we mean. Great family history stories and information are on the way now with Extreme Genes, Family History Radio, and ExtremeGenes.com. Yeah, I don't think Mother knew about this. Uncle Marvin was strangled by his own beard. Yep, you never saw it coming. Greetings, genies across America. I am Fisher, the radio root sleuth, and this is Extreme Genes, America's family history show on ExtremeGenes.com, the program where we shake your family tree and watch the nuts fall out. And I hope your family research is progressing. I had an interesting experience this past week helping a longtime family friend identify her birth mother. She had a profile of her birth mother and her family, how many brothers and sisters, even some occupations tied to the siblings, but no names. She'd done a DNA test. And while I knew about triangulation and how it worked, I'd never actually done it before myself. Now, triangulation is where you look at the family trees of the people you match in your DNA test and try to determine a common ancestor. Well, she had numerous third cousin matches, a fair number of second cousins, and one first cousin. What many of them had in common, including the first cousin, was the family name Hunsaker, now, that didn't mean that the birth mother was necessarily a Hunsaker, only that she was at least descended from a Hunsaker. Well, after five hours and by researching the lines of descent of the various matching cousins and using what we knew about the birth mother's family, we were finally able to determine who my friend's birth mother had been. The birth mother had died in 2008. But my friend learned that she had at least four half-siblings. Now she has to decide what to do with this information, introduce herself to the family, or simply be satisfied with knowing who her birth mother was and what her blood lineage is. She even found a remarkably detailed obituary of the woman who gave birth to her back in 1959. As this develops, maybe we'll get my friend on to talk about the whole adventure and what she's intending to do. For now, she's just processing the fact that she now knows what she's wondered about her entire life. I hear from people regularly who are looking for birth parents, and this should give you hope that one day you, too, will find what you're looking for. Hey, I'm excited about our guest today. First up will be a man who started his career working with probate records for a division of Ancestry. He eventually left there and began a company that helps people who may be in line for an inheritance from a distant, sometimes unknown relative. Now, this line of work has led him to research Nazi records and have experiences that can only be called remarkable. Jim Brott from the Family History Research Group of probate genealogy specialists will tell us some of those stories coming up in about eight minutes. And I'll tell you, from finding next of kin to a long-missing murder victim to helping people inherit money from strangers, you never know where genealogical research will take you. And after Jim, our friend Stan Lindis from HeritageConsulting.com returns to talk about one of the basics, digitized newspapers. What you can find, what are the big sources, and how is it growing? He'll have all of that coming up for you later in the show. And what about preserving old documents? Tom Perry, our preservation authority from TMCPlace.com, is a bottomless pit of information. You'll undoubtedly pick up a tip or two from him at the back end of the hour. And just a reminder, podcasts of past Extreme Gene shows are a library of information and great stories. You can listen to all of our past shows on iTunes, iHeartRadio's talk channel, and ExtremeGenes.com. And if you haven't downloaded our free podcast app for your iPhone or Android, you need to take care of that. Just go to your phone store and punch in Extreme Genes. It's time once again for your family histoire news for this week, and we begin with congratulations to England's George Kirby and Doreen Lucky. They're getting married in June, at which time their combined age will be, get this, 
194. Yeah, today she's 91 and he's 102, but there will be a birthday uh, somewhere in between here. That will make them the oldest newlyweds in the world ever. You got to wonder who's going to catch the bouquet that day. In Olivet, Missouri, a most unique reunion has taken place. Zella Jackson Price has met her daughter, Melanie Diane Gilmore, for the first time. Now, Zella's 76 and Melanie is 49. Melanie flew into St. Louis with her own daughter and son, where her brother Harvey was there to greet her, also for the first time. Now, here's what this is all about. Back in 1966, at Homer G. Phillips Hospital in St. Louis, Zella delivered Melanie. But Zella was told that her infant daughter had died. The only thing that's known after that is that Melanie was adopted out, certainly the victim of a kidnapping. Zella and Melanie are thrilled at the second chance to be a part of each other's lives. It was a DNA test that brought them together. An investigation will soon be opening into just what happened in that hospital 49 years ago. In the meantime, Zella says there's nothing greater than this. Nothing. In Grand Forks, North Dakota, 97-year-old Molly Olson recently received a fascinating letter from her grandfather. Yeah, it was written on September 26th, 1889, using perfect handwriting. The letter was sent to his fiance in Pennsylvania, Molly's namesake and later grandmother, Molly McFarland. Well, grandfather, named Sylvester Bessie Marshall, had moved from Pennsylvania to Emirato, North Dakota, to settle land and was begging his love to leave Pennsylvania and join him. This multi-page letter was in its original envelope with the two-cent stamp. Sylvester had already waited a couple of years for Molly to join him, and he was becoming more and more anxious to see her. Molly Olson says eventually she came. The most remarkable part of all this is how the letter came into Molly's hands. Well, some 10 or 20 years ago in Dassel, Minnesota's public library, a woman named Velma Jorgensen found the letter inside a book. It eventually ended up in the hands of Diane Rose now, who is in the course of some of her own family history research. Well, she tracked down Molly Olson. Molly says she's going to make copies of the letter for each family member of her grandfather, Sylvester. She says he was the nicest old man who ever walked the earth. Wherever he went, I went with him. And that's your family histoire news for this week. Read about these and other stories on our website, ExtremeGenes.com. And coming up next, you'll hear from a man whose involvement in family history has taken him in a whole different direction in life, which has included researching the records of Nazi Germany. We'll talk to Jim Brott of the Family History Research Group Probate Genealogy Specialist next when we return in three minutes on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show at ExtremeGenes.com. Genies, not long ago, something happened with one particular online research service that changed everything. It happened with a service that already has 75 million members worldwide, and it's not who you think it is. Hi, it's Fisher, and you know I'm always looking for new and better ways for you to discover your ancestors, not just the data, but the stories. The online service I'm talking about takes your family tree and then uses its powerful automated technology to match the people in your tree to over 5 billion records from around the world. Censuses, newspaper stories, vital records with 97% accuracy. This means no more wading through thousands of useless so-called hints. This also means the site itself is constantly looking for matches for you even while you're sleeping. What site does all this? It's MyHeritage.com. You can try MyHeritage.com for free. Here's a special gift from me. Use discount code ExtremeGenes after signing up and get an exclusive 20% discount at MyHeritage.com. How's your family history research going? Are you stuck on a difficult line? Don't know how to start? Let the professionals at Heritage Consulting Genealogy Research Services help. Heritage Consulting has been providing professional research and consultation services since 1978. They can help you find your own personal family history for far less than you would expect by researching, collecting, analyzing, and interpreting the numerous historical documents your ancestors left in their lifetimes. They'll then provide you with a professionally written report 
in book or electronic form that you and your family can enjoy for literally generations. Knowledge of your ancestors forges stronger ties within your family and helps children better appreciate who they are within the context of your family history. Call Heritage Consulting Genealogy Research Services right now. The call is free. Dial 1-877-537-2000. That's 1-877-537-2000. You'll speak directly to an expert genealogist. Find out more at heritageconsulting.com. While we all love diving into the deep end of our gene pool, don't forget about capturing the histories of those who are still with us. Go to StoryWorth.com to start your family's story today. Each week, StoryWorth.com will email a question to people whose stories you wish to preserve. Questions like, tell us about the day you got engaged, or what do you remember about your grandmother? All they have to do is reply with a story, either by email or by telephone. That story is then forwarded to the family and securely stored in a private online storybook. It doesn't get any simpler. You can enroll up to six storytellers for, get this, just $49 a year. You'll get a free one-month trial. And for a limited time, Extreme Genes listeners get an additional 10% discount at StoryWorth.com slash Extreme Genes. That's StoryWorth.com slash Extreme Genes. Is your family story worth 13 cents a day? Sign up now at StoryWorth.com slash Extreme Genes. Simple, secure, effective. Your story is worth telling. Welcome back to Extreme Genes, America's family history show and ExtremeGenes.com. It is Fisher here, your radio root sleuth with Jim Brott. He is the president, the CEO, the Grand Imperial Poobah of probate genealogy specialists at the Family History Research Group. Jim, welcome to the show. Thank you, Scott. It's good to be here. Nice to have you. And, you know, probate is an area, I think, that to those who are just getting through maybe their beginning stages of research are thinking maybe there's something there. And I think there's an education you can share in this that could help us out a bit. Of course, everybody knows about wills, that they name the next of kin, that they can name siblings and certainly spouses, maybe in-laws. And and maybe that's from the school of the obvious, but there've got to be other areas that give us information that are a bit less talked about. Absolutely. Wills can be some of the most helpful tools of genealogy because it lists a lot of the information about the family. But beyond that, for some of those who are out there doing genealogy a lot and feel like they've kind of reached a maximum amount of research that they can do on their own families, what began for me was helping other people do their genealogy work through Expert Connect, which was part of Ancestry. One of the people that contacted me was a person who had a cousin who had died, and for 12 years they'd been trying to solve this probate case where the inheritance had not been distributed because the family couldn't prove the relationship to the first cousin that they had. And they contacted me and asked for my help in solving this case. And for some genealogists, this is a great opportunity to help other people solve mysteries, solve cases, and receive those inheritances to the family and then get a portion of the inheritance. I actually had that happen once. Did you? Yeah, I got a a letter one day. My wife and I went out and uh, she said, I'm going to go for a jog. And I said, well, you go do that. I checked the mail. I get this letter from uh, somebody in California, the Bureau of Missing Heirs, addressed to my wife, but I thought she'd let me read it and (laughs) because it caught my attention pretty quickly and found out that there was somebody who had died there. They had somehow determined was related to my wife. And uh, as we got into it, the common ancestor dated back to 1786. Oh, wow. And there were no relatives, and, uh, and you know, your mind is just going crazy. How much money could possibly be involved here? And, right. And there were crazy rules that uh, the person who inherited could be no more than 19 years old and, and had to overlap the life of the decedent by at least a day. Uh, and, and so we had to work it out with some cousins and the like. There was like eleven, twelve thousand dollars involved. Yeah. So it was, you know, it was kind of fun more than anything else. Right. In most cases, uh, when somebody dies without a will, it's called intestate, 
And those cases, the money goes to the state. They are kind of like overseers of that money until somebody comes forward and says, yes, I am a heir, I'm a relative, and they proceed to claim and then make proof of that claim through the court system. And usually it's a, like in New York, it would be called a surrogate's court. Right. And the attorneys get involved, those that protect the rights of those who are unknown heirs and also the state to make sure that they're taken care of, making sure that they don't give the money to somebody who rightfully doesn't belong to. So they protect it. And then the uh, guardian ad litem who protects the rights of those who are unknown heirs, maybe even adopted heirs or something to that effect, they protect those rights. And then you have the attorneys for those who think they are correct heirs, and they present their case before these referees of the judge or the, uh, the guardian ad litem and the public administrator's office. And it's really interesting to go to the court and see this procedure and see all the cases as they unfold. There's interesting cases such as in New York right now, there's uh, Roman Bloom, who was a Holocaust survivor. And he was also a uh, real estate developer in Staten Island. And he had millions of dollars when he died. And he had over $40 million. And it's the largest estate that the state of New York has ever seen. And You mean as far as not having anybody to give it to? Right. And so the state had to go and make sure that they did a genealogy research to find out his ancestry, and they hired several different companies to do the research, and none of them could find any heirs. Then one or two people came forward and said, oh, yeah, we have a will for this person. Well, some of these claims are really outlandish. <laughs> but then this one is really interesting. Before he died, he had sent a letter to his girlfriend that he knew before the war started, and they were separated. And he was going to marry her, but because of the war, they got separated. Her family, I think, went to Russia, and he got sent to the uh, concentration camps. And he wanted to leave something for this girlfriend of his. She also had a child with him, but they weren't married. And so he wrote a will, wrote all this in a love letter back to her. And I think she lived in Poland at the time. And with the will, his desire for her to receive everything when he died. So now this housekeeper who is in this woman's will, she is now going to the court saying, I've got the will of this man who died, and the lady who hired me as the housekeeper, she put me in her will to receive her inheritance. Oh! And so now this person, <laughs> this housekeeper, is going to eventually receive all this $40 million. Oh, my goodness. And You know, the thing that's always frightening about that, that's the kind of money that ruins people's lives. Oh, yeah. You know, one way or another. I've had... Uh, you know, Although I think we'd all take the risk. Absolutely. I, I did have one person that turned down an inheritance. He was about in his 90s, and he said, I'm just too old to receive this money. I, I really don't know what to do with it, so I don't want anything to do with it. And some of them have a little bit of a feeling like if they take the money, they might be cursed <laughs> for taking right. the money. And so there's that you know, a little bit of a reluctance on some of the people's part. But most of the people are very, very happy to hear from me when I tell yeah. them, you know, you, you have an inheritance coming to you, and here's the situation. Most cases, uh, nine times out of ten, it's a contingency fee, just like a lawyer who would sure. take your case charges a contingency fee. Typically, around the industry, is, is very typical, 30 to 40 percent of the inheritance. And that includes the cost of the lawyer, the attorney that sure. we hire to plead the case before there. And really, there's a lot of proof that has to go into this with the courts. It has to be pretty much undeniable. It does. I mean, beyond any doubt. You have to have great documentation, eyewitnesses. If you can provide friends, neighbors, third-party witnesses that, Support. that don't have any anything to do with the case, those are strong cases. For instance, this last case that we worked on in New York, we had the doorman of the apartment building where the decedent lived, and he knew her for 20 years. He'd been the doorman for that long of a period of time, and she had been there for a long, long time, and he knew her well, and he was able to testify in court 
And then we had like a 93-year-old friend of hers who was very close, and they partied a lot. And the two of them even were in a house staying when our fire broke out. And they had to be rescued, and the newspaper wrote a story about it. Wow. And this lady, uh, (laughs) she came to New York from Palm Springs, Florida, and testified in court to plead the case. Now, what's the most money you've ever dealt with in terms of an inheritance? The, The Bloom case, I worked on a little bit with those that were working on it, but the current case that I do have right now is a $4.2 million case. Is that a significant, unusual amount? Uh, it is. Most of the cases tend to be about a million to $500,000. And even a case like $250,000 doesn't seem like a lot, but if there's not very many errors... That can be a a nice thing. Yeah. Yeah. On this Holocaust victim, the first one that I did, it was only about $250,000 after the state and all the attorneys took all their fees. It probably was a $500,000 case to begin with. But, you know, $250,000 split between two heirs was basically all it was. That was a lot of money to them. Sure. And this one was a 93-year-old woman survivor from the Holocaust. She was living in Sweden, and she was wonderful, very, very alert, very energetic. I was amazed by her testimony. Gave great information about the, uh, the Holocaust and what they went through at the beginning of the Holocaust before they all got split up. Wow. She and her husband actually got sent to a work camp where they made glass. They didn't see each other for the entire war. She thought her husband was killed on the death march. And then six months later, after the war ended, she was in a hospital in Sweden, and she got a phone call. Well, all the women on that floor all went to the office to see what was going on, you know, because nobody got phone calls very often. And here she was, she's talking, and it's her husband on the other side of the phone. He tells her, I'm alive, I'm still in Germany. It took him six months to get to Sweden and get rejoined together with the two of them. And it was just a beautiful story of how they survived the entire Holocaust. We uh, researched a lot of the Nazi records that had Holocaust victim information that showed different death records for some of the the other cousins that had died during the uh, Holocaust. It was just a wow. interesting. This just had to be the most consuming thing for you. It was. It took about two years to finally complete in the courtroom helped me to get a a better understanding of what the Holocaust was. He's Jim Brott. He's with the Family History Research Group, probate genealogy specialist. Fascinating stuff, Jim. You know, you never know where genealogy is going to take you and family history. And uh, you've been on worldwide adventures through time and space. I have, and this has been an enjoyable adventure. Thanks for coming on. I appreciate it. And coming up next in five minutes, our good friend Stan Lindis from HeritageConsulting.com talking about one of the basics, digitized newspapers. What kind of nuggets in your family history are waiting for you there? He'll tell you, and he'll have some great examples, I'm sure, on the way in minutes on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show. Scientific studies have proven that youth who know even a little bit about their family history perform better academically and have a greater sense of personal confidence and stability. Genealogy is its own incredible superpower that arms our children with super strength. But how do you get your child or grandchild interested in studying their family history? That kind of stuff is just for grandmas, right? Not anymore. ZapTheGrandmaGap.com leaps the generation gap in a single bound. Author Janet Havorka provides you with useful and timely advice on helping the young people in your life become engaged in their own family history. Janet has an entire collection of books to inspire the young and the young at heart in fun, interactive ways. She also offers creative tips and advice on her blog and in her free weekly newsletter. Stop by ZapTheGrandmaGap.com today to sign up for Janet's free email newsletter with 52 weeks of easy tips, free downloads, and order your set of resource books and workbooks. Can't figure out how to get your favorite Windows genealogy software running on your MacBook? Look no further than Crossover. Crossover by Codeweavers at www.codeweavers.com allows you to run your Windows software on your Mac without the need to buy a copy of Windows. Crossover is easy to install and simple to use. Crossover supports many popular genealogy packages like Roots Magic, Legacy Family Tree, Personal Ancestral File, Family Tree Builder, and more. 
Crossover also lets you run other popular productivity apps, like Microsoft Office and a wide range of games. So if you're looking for an easy, affordable solution to your Windows compatibility needs, visit www.codeweavers.com today to download your free trial of Crossover. And don't forget to use the deal code FAMILY for an additional 40% off when you purchase Crossover. Looking for an easy way to show off your family history and share it with your family? Family Chart Masters offers beautiful custom pedigree art pieces and inexpensive family reunion draft charts in any design or size that fits your needs. With a free consultation at FamilyChartMasters.com, you can get started creating a new family masterpiece. Family Chart Masters has over 11 years of experience in creating and printing family charts. They can print any style genealogy chart from any genealogy file and can create exactly what you're looking for. You'll work with a specialized and talented consultant whose goal is to make you happy. Decorative charts make fantastic gifts for all occasions. And with Family Chart Master's option of ordering duplicate charts at half price along with your original purchase at full price, you can afford to give a family heirloom to each member of your family. Contact Family Chart Masters today at FamilyChartMasters.com for your free consultation. Family Chart Masters will give the greatest care to your family history. Hey, welcome back to Extreme Genes, America's family history show. ExtremeGenes.com. Fisher here, the Radio Root Sleuth. With my good friend, a regular on the show, Stan Lindis from HeritageConsulting.com. Welcome back, Stan. Good to see you. It's good to be back, Fish. And, you know, digitized newspapers, we've talked about this from the beginning and, and several times through. But, you know, the reality is we all need to be reminded about some of these fundamentals because there is no better source for stories anywhere yeah, than and, digitized newspapers, and they're just hidden there waiting for you. As we were talking before, it's it's not unlike me as a child and my mother having to constantly tell me over and over again yeah. to do something or how to do something. <laughs> but as a professional, even, I work in the field every day, and I get a little bit tunnel-visioned where I will do certain things to the exclusion of other resources that I know are there that I've used over and over again. All of us do that. So I think, I, so. I think you're right about uh, needing to revisit and be reminded of certain basic resources that are just a goldmine of information and a treasure trove of stories. You know, I had a friend of mine talking to me casually one day about his background up in Canada, and I thought, I'm going to go see what I can find for him. And the first thing I did was I popped the names in Google, and it brought up Canadian newspaper yes. sites. And their names were in there yes. just through a Google search. And so I, I came back later to his home and I shared some of these stories from his own childhood, his parents, his grandparents from Calgary, Canada. And I said, take a look at that. And he says, oh, where did you go to find these? I said, a very little known site called Google. Yeah. And, and that's a great starting point just to find uh, digitized for, for newspapers. Anything. For, for, anything. for anything. For yes. anything. Anything and everything. You may think, uh, oh, you know, I need to be looking in all of these records. But there are times when, well, virtually on every case I do, I put names and places into Google just to see what pops up. Why wouldn't I? Right. I mean, it's a freebie for crying out loud. It's a starting point. Yeah. Others may have given yeah. you some information. Maybe they haven't documented it the way you want. Yeah. But newspaper stories come up on there. Google has their own digitized newspapers they that they're collecting. And, and they are constantly adding to them. And there are a multitude of sites that specialize in newspapers. There's Genealogy Bank, there's Newspaper Archives, there's Newspapers.com, there's Google. There's, there's FultonHistory.com. Yes, exactly. For New York especially. And they may have duplicated their efforts in some cases, but in every one of these, they each have something that the others do not. That's right. And you need to look at a multitude of these sources. Even going back to your Google and Canada thing, I have an ancestor by the name of William Brown, and he had a sister, Elizabeth. They were from Scotland. They came to Canada in the 1700s. You know, I'm thinking I'll never find out where they came from in Scotland. For heaven's sakes, William Brown? 
Give me a break. Yeah, right. Give me a break. <laughs> oh, by the way, he married a Mary White. Oh, boy. I mean, yeah. I looked and I looked and looked for William, and I just, out of curiosity, went to Google, and I put in newspapers in Ontario, and there was an obituary for the sister. It was a three-liner, basically a death announcement as opposed to an obituary, and in it, it provided the exact place of birth in Scotland oh. for the sister. I would have never found it. Right. Never, ever found it. Now, having said that, I have since discovered while in Scotland that I probably would have looked for it for a long time because the place is completely gone. Oh. The village doesn't exist anymore. Wow. So anyway, but it, but But yeah. still, do, but the, still, do the records exist there? Yeah, there are records there. I mean, they were kept and it was a gateway to more information. That's right. I mean, I'm back five or six more generations in Scotland because I went to this newspaper. And what I love about it, even more than just gathering more vital material about it, is the information about them. Some of the stories are hysterical. You know, keep in mind that, that people do not write newspaper stories because they're everyday things. And, and although there's a lot of that, too, especially in the smaller towns. But the unusual stuff, it, it just absolutely blows your mind. Now, here's one story that I came across a few years ago. My wife's great-great-grandfather we were warned when we first started in the 80s, my mother-in-law said, oh, you don't want to do that. We just got a bunch of cattle thieves and, and rustlers back there. We had a cattle thief and rustler back there. He was a guy, he was a big time rancher in Indiana. And it turns out that he ran off with the wife of a ranch hand, a young wife, left his wife and nine children behind and defrauded a bank out of like uh, ten thousand, twenty thousand dollars worth of steer, and then sold those before he'd paid for them. Took the money from that, changed his name, and moved with the woman to another state, where he was found living under his mother's maiden name, which was Turner. So he went from Thomas Stout to Thomas Turner, brought back to Indiana, where he was shamed. Basically, never faced any kind no of criminal. prosecution. Nothing. I can't find anything where he served any time or. No, he had to pay the money back, promised he'd pay the money back, and then he had to go face his wife, which was probably sentence enough. Uh, and, yeah. And then when he died, this is the thing that blew my mind, is that we, we get into the papers years later, there's his obituary, talks about how well-respected he had been in the community for decades, and never ever went into the background of his running off with this other woman and defrauding the bank and stealing the cattle. It's amazing what you can discover. All those grand things like your story about the cattle thief and other nefarious things. Yes. <laughs> Mostly that's what you find when it's a big story. But like you said before, in the rural areas, you get the everyday stuff. My second great-grandfather, Alfred M. Botsford, he shows up in the newspaper. He was a kind of a shaky guy anyway, a whole nother story, and I've told it before, I think. But in this particular case, he shows up in the newspaper. And it says that dear Alfred would be proud to speak with anyone about his hen, which had laid an egg. <laughs> well, you know, you can oh. stop. You can stop there. But you go, is this really newsworthy? Well, I guess the egg measured almost eight inches around one way and seven inches the other. I'm thinking Alfred probably had fried chicken for dinner. Mm. But you know, another one I discovered uh, a year before a great grandfather got married. He convinced his brother that they should take violin lessons. Who and knew? With, with it, with I had no idea. <laughs> uh, I didn't know any of us. And that had, was in the paper. I, I think. Oh yeah. And well, and then subsequent to that, within the year, you see them showing up as providing music at this wedding or this social event or something of that nature. There's no telling what you're going to find in there. Obviously, we think of newspapers and obituaries. One obituary for one of my ancestors, I discovered seven additional children that I had no idea that even existed. Wow. Yeah. Newspapers are a great resource. Not to mention, it's fun to discover yes. that bread cost 52 cents <laughs> then or, or, or whatever. Yes. I mean, you can get distracted really easily in the newspapers. And we should mention here, too, that I think a lot of people hear us talk about some of this, and you just hear the, the, the price tag rolling yeah. up in your head, and yeah. it's like, oh, the cost of another subscription and this one. There are a lot of freebies out there. Yes. There are even some where you can get in, and you can get a free week or two with it. Yep. And let me tell you, yep. with a week or two, 
free, you, you can get through a lot of information. You can lose a lot of sleep, but get a lot done. You really can. So it, it's available, like we mentioned in New York, FultonHistory.com is run by a guy who doesn't take any advertising. It's purely a service. He has more newspaper pages than the Library of Congress on yeah. that site. And in addition to that, you can go to libraries or family history centers, and they have access to subscription sites that may be different from the public library having their subscription site access than what you have at a family history center. You can get to newspapers for free. If you have problems with doing it online, you can still go to your public library and tell the librarian, I want to order a microfilm of the newspaper for this town, for this time period. And you can get the microfilm, go back to the library, sit down, take your time cranking through it, and have the time of your life flying back in the time machine. It's exactly yeah. what it is. I don't yeah. think there's any more fun source oh, yeah. than digitized newspapers. I'm with you. Great reminder, Stan. Stan Lindis from HeritageConsulting.com. Appreciate having you in again. Tom Perry coming up next, our Preservation Authority, answering more of your questions when we return in three minutes on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show. Hi, Genies, it's Fisher, and I've been telling you about MyHeritage.com's amazing new technology that searches your family tree day and night for you, finding matches even while you sleep in documents and other people's trees. Here's a find I never would have made without it. It's a newspaper story about a relative of mine, Paul Sagal, who I knew many years ago. It's from 1943, when Paul was serving in the Pacific. When he learned his father died, he wrote a poem to his brother that indicated he wouldn't be returning for the funeral. He wrote, There'll be no furlough for me. I'm in the Marines, you see, alive and well as I am. Memories I'll keep of my dad. Then the newspaper editor added, These are all the sentiments that will win this war. There are treasures like this one waiting for you now. Put MyHeritage.com superb technology to work for you with a 20% discount. Just enter the one-word promo code ExtremeGenes. MyHeritage.com is the next big thing. While we all love diving into the deep end of our gene pool, don't forget about capturing the histories of those who are still with us. Go to StoryWorth.com to start your family's story today. Each week, StoryWorth.com will email a question to people whose stories you wish to preserve. Questions like, tell us about the day you got engaged, or what do you remember about your grandmother? All they have to do is reply with a story, either by email or by telephone. That story is then forwarded to the family and securely stored in a private online storybook. It doesn't get any simpler. You can enroll up to six storytellers for, get this, just $49 a year. You'll get a free one-month trial. And for a limited time, Extreme Genes listeners get an additional 10% discount at StoryWorth.com slash Extreme Genes. That's StoryWorth.com slash Extreme Genes. Is your family story worth 13 cents a day? Sign up now at StoryWorth.com slash Extreme Genes. Simple, secure, effective. Your story is worth telling. Your priceless 8mm home movies and your precious family videos are deteriorating right now. Heat, moisture, insects, dust, mold, time, they're all robbing you of your family's memories. It's time to preserve those treasures right now by digitizing them at TMCPlace.com. They've been preserving memories for over 40 years. Home movies, videos, audio tapes, vinyl records, photos, slides, and even scrapbooks. Whether your treasures are enduring the humidity of Massachusetts or the heat of Arizona, TMCPlace.com can digitize your audio and images without harming the originals and returning them to you with free shipping both ways on most orders. TMCPlace.com can even let you track your package in real time with a special GPS tracking device. Trustworthy, experienced, affordable. Call TMCPlace.com toll-free at 1-866-483-1717 to talk to Extreme Genes Preservation Authority Tom Perry about your project or order online at shop.tmcplace.com. Hey, welcome back to Extreme Genes Family History Radio, ExtremeGenes.com. It is Fisher here with our Preservation Authority. He's Tom Perry from TMCPlace.com. Welcome back, Tom. 
Good to be back. Good to see you. We've got more questions that have been emailed to asktom at tmcplace.com. Leanne Long, writing from Michigan S. On last week's show, I heard about storing VHS tapes. I have several that I can see that looks like white mold on the edges of the tape. Can they be cleaned or transferred to a DVD? Yipes, Tom. Yes and yes. Okay. Absolutely. We can do both. We actually have an industrial tape cleaner that's made for VHS tapes that we can run it through. And if for some reason the mold is too bad, we have another option. In fact, we had somebody, oh, I guess about six months ago, that had about 50 tapes that had kind of been in a flood. The box that they were in was all wet. It got mold spores inside the videotapes, and you could see the white mold. They were really too bad to actually go through our cleaner. So what we did is we found a VHS tape at Goodwill. And purchased that, brought it in, tied it into our system, <laughs> and then just ran all the tapes through. Because the problem is the spores in the mold will get in your heads eventually, and then they will transfer to all the other tapes. you so got to be kidding me. Oh, wow. No. Oh, yeah. It's just like a disease. You put it in there, it'll get on the next tape, it'll grow, and it's just like an infection. So what do you do to keep this from happening in the future? Well, the best thing to do so you don't get that on your tapes anymore is we suggest you get some uncooked rice. Please make sure it's uncooked. <laughs> uncooked. I've heard of people just thinking, oh, rice, and they cooked up some rice and did this. And no. That no. <laughs> it must be uncooked rice. You get a cheesecloth and wrap the rice in that. It doesn't matter how much you put in, the more the merrier. Okay. And then just tie it with a string or something. You want to use a rubber band because rubber band eventually will dry out and crack. So just, you know, get some string and tie around it or one of those uh, little clips that come with uh Ziploc, would bread. that work? Yeah, now this needs to go inside a Ziploc bag. Okay. So a zip tie would work, just something to hold the cheesecloth with the uncooked rice, and then put that inside a Ziploc bag with the tapes. And that will help to absorb any moisture. And just check from time to time. Whenever they're starting getting, you know, gooey at all, you know, any moisture you know that's in there, throw them away and put some more in there. And this really depends on what part of the country you live in and how humid it is, I would assume. Generally, but like even places like out west where it's drier, if you have like a lot of people out there have these things they call fruit rooms, and they get so cold it causes condensation even though it's kind of the desert area. So I suggest, you know, any place just put it in. It's not that big of a deal. This way you won't get the mold spores. If you do, like I say, pick up a VCR at Goodwill. We'll transfer all the tapes and then throw the VCR away when we're done. Okay, we got another one here from Fred Myers. All right, spelled different than the grocery store. It's uh, from Memphis, Tennessee. He writes, why should we keep optical things like slides and film, like you suggested? They're what they are, and how could new technology later make them better? Okay, the way it is, it's the resolution. The actual scanning process, which we use, has a higher, let's call it DPI or megapixels. So it actually can pull out and extrapolate things that the old ones couldn't see. For instance, my father had a whole bunch of old 8 millimeter tapes. Thank heavens he didn't throw them away. Some of the pictures were so dark, all you could see was silhouettes. When we shot it in high definition, we were able to pull out enough information that you can actually make out faces and stuff. So don't ever just throw it away just because it's too dark. We might wow. be able to pull it out. And, you know, five years from now or maybe even a year from now, we can do better. All right. Great question, Fred. Thanks for that. And, of course, if you have a question for Tom, you can email him at asktom at tmcplace.com. And coming up next, we're going to talk more about home videos because every week we, we find out they're dying. They're going away. Coming up next on Extreme Genes Family History Radio and ExtremeGenes.com. Looking for an easy way to show off your family history and share it with your family? Family Chart Masters offers beautiful custom pedigree art pieces and inexpensive family reunion draft charts in any design or size that fits your needs. With a free consultation at FamilyChartMasters.com, you can get started creating a new family masterpiece. Family Chart Masters has over 11 years of experience in creating and printing family charts. They can print any style of genealogy chart from any genealogy file and can create exactly what you're looking for. You'll work with a specialized and talented a consultant whose goal is to make you happy. Decorative charts make fantastic gifts for all occasions. And with Family Chart Master's option of ordering duplicate charts at half price along with your original purchase at full price, you can afford to give a family heirloom to each member of your family. Contact Family Chart Masters today at FamilyChartMasters.com for your free consultation. Family Chart Masters will give the greatest care to your family history.
When was the last time you heard your grandmother's voice or saw your family enjoying life back in the 1950s or 60s? If the reason is you haven't known what to do with your old recordings, videos, and films, here's your answer. The Multimedia Center in Salt Lake City. We brought in a video project to the Multimedia Center, and overnight, they duplicated it to DVD so we could meet our deadline. The Multimedia Center, 2870 East, 3300 South, Salt Lake City. Open Monday through Friday, 10 to 6. Call 801-483-1717 or go to Transfer Duplication. Com. Hello, Extreme Jeans listeners. I'm Larry Gelwix, the getaway guru and host of the Travel Show radio broadcast with the hottest travel deals on the planet. And now you can travel more and pay less by joining me on our Travel Show podcast. Cruises, tours, resort hotels, airline tickets, stay close to home or travel the world. I'll show you how to travel more and pay less. Go online to columbusvacations.com. That's columbusvacations.com. Click on radio. Radio, and then click on podcast. It's really that simple. ColumbusVacations.com, radio and podcast for the hottest travel deals on the planet. Can't figure out how to get your favorite Windows genealogy software running on your MacBook? Look no further than Crossover. Crossover by Codeweavers at www.codeweavers.com allows you to run your Windows software on your Mac without the need to buy a copy of Windows. Crossover is easy to install and simple to use. Crossover supports many popular genealogy packages like Roots Magic, Legacy Family Tree, Personal Ancestral File, Family Tree Builder, and more. Crossover also lets you run other popular productivity apps like Microsoft Office and a wide range of games. So if you're looking for an easy, affordable solution to your Windows compatibility needs, Visit www.codeweavers.com today to download your free trial of Crossover. And don't forget to use the deal code FAMILY for an additional 40% off when you purchase Crossover. Scientific studies have proven that youth who know even a little bit about their family history perform better academically and have a greater sense of personal confidence and stability. Genealogy is its own incredible superpower that arms our children with super strength. But how do you get your child or grandchild interested in studying their family history? That kind of stuff is just for grandmas, right? Not anymore. ZapTheGrandmaGap.com leaps the generation gap in a single bound. Author Janet Havorka provides you with useful and timely advice on helping the young people in your life become engaged in their own family history. Janet has an entire collection of books to inspire the young and the young at heart in fun, interactive ways. She also offers creative tips and advice on her blog and in her free weekly newsletter. Stop by ZapTheGrandmaGap.com today to sign up for Janet's free email newsletter with 52 weeks of easy tips, free downloads, and order your set of resource books and workbooks. You have found us, Extreme Genes, Family History Radio, ExtremeGenes.com. It is Fisher here, your congenial radio root sleuth. With Tom Perry, he is our preservation authority from TMCPlace.com. And uh, for the last little bit, we've been kicking around, Tom, uh, these videos that we all took back in, in the 1990s, the 1980s even, and the early part of this century. And we're seeing that there's a lot of problems happening here that I don't think anybody ever anticipated when these things first came out. One of the biggest problems is just particles just kind of falling off the polyester binding that's on them. And it's caused from heat, humidity. It's just from playing the tape. And so we're seeing that uh, with these old tapes, there are various things, though, that are kind of unique to each type of tape you may have, right? Correct. Absolutely. So let, let's start with the earliest stuff, which would be the VHS, I assume. Right. VHS and Betamax were the first consumer ones. They had three-quarter inch before that, but that was mostly professional. Betamax was so much superior to VHS, but unfortunately, Sony kind of shot themselves in the foot. They wouldn't license the technology to anybody unless they jumped through Sony's hoops. Or JVC, they had VHS would license anybody to send them a check. Right. And so because there were so many machines out there, the prices came down more and more and more. So people thought, wow, this one deck is two hundred dollars, this other one's only hundred and twenty five. I'll go with VHS, not knowing that Betamax is so much better and the tapes fall apart. Now one of the things with VHS too that people really get confused with, there's also a smaller VHS format called VHS C, which is totally compatible with VHS. You can get a little adapter, put your VHS C in it and play it on your VHS machines. And the reason that JVC came out with that 
is to kind of combat the Hi8 tapes that came out that were smaller and more compact to make smaller cameras. Because if you remember the old ones, the camera and the deck were two separate pieces. And they were heavy, they were bulky, they were just a pain. So Sony released the um, regular 8s, the height, and the digital 8s, which we'll get back to in just a minute. And so JVC came out with the VHS-C to kind of, you know, fight them. We have people coming in all the time that say, hey, I've got this video 8. I need an adapter so I can watch it my VHS machine because I know they make them. I know they don't make them. If you look at VHS, Hi8, MiniDV, Betamax, all these, look at it as different countries and different languages. They don't talk to each other. Whereas with VHS, it's still like, say, like America, but it's different parts of America, so they're still totally compatible with each other. When you get into SVHS, which was a better format of VHS, which is a little bit more professional, VHS tape will play in it and a VHS-C will play in it. But you cannot play a VHS tape in a VHS machine. So if somebody made a professional thing of your kids playing football or soccer or dance club and says SVHS and it won't play on your machine, don't worry about it. Bring it into us or send it in to us and we can transfer it to a DVD for you because we have the equipment. So all of this stuff, though, ultimately, you've got to get digitized, right? Oh, exactly. It's dying, you know. And in fact, I tell people, get your stuff in, get it transferred, or call a corner, because you're going to have to pick up your tapes and dispose of them. So at the end of the day, Tom, if somebody goes to their local version of you, whatever that may be, Uh what kind of costs can they expect to incur dealing with these different types of tapes? It depends. It's really inexpensive. You can get it for as little as $18 all the way up, depending on what you're going for. If your tape's in good condition, you don't need anything special. Most of the outlets that we work with that we do their transfers for them usually are about $20 to $24, but sometimes they run specials for as little as $17.95. But you can go onto our website, and if we have a location closer to you, you can take it into them or just order a box from us. We'll send you everything you need, the GPS tracker. Send it to us, and we'll get it transferred for you. What are your memories worth, right? Oh, exactly. And I tell people, I says, you come in, you buy your kids for Christmas a widescreen TV you paid $500 for. Five years from now, they won't remember that TV, but they will remember your tapes. And a lot of people that come in, they say they're the best babysitters in the world. Grandkids love watching Mommy and Daddy when they were little kids, and it's better than SpongeBob. <laughs> Great stuff. Tom Perry, thanks for joining us. Good to be here. Hey, thanks once again to Stan Lindis from HeritageConsulting.com with a great reminder about how important a resource digitized newspapers are these days. And to James Brott from the Family History Research Group talking about probate genealogy, what that might mean to you someday when a stranger passes and passes their money on to you. Catch you again next week. Thanks for joining us. And remember, as far as everyone knows, we're a nice, normal family. 